I want to welcome you once again to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises, the program where we take an intergenerational approach to the book of Revelation. I'm John Pauline. I'm professor of religion at Loma Linda University, and with me is... Iris Mamgye. I'm with the School of Nursing at Loma Linda University. And... And I'm Guilherme Borda, and I am a PhD student at Andrews University. Now, you remember, if you saw our previous program, we ended with the idea that Armageddon, that big, big word that appears only once in the Bible in Revelation 16, 16, is recalling the Mount Carmel experience uh, of ancient Israel. And that in that Mount Carmel experience, everyone was asked to make a firm decision which side of the conflict they were going to go with. Are they going to follow Yahweh? the God of Israel, they're going to follow Baal, uh, the God of the Canaanites. So, uh, Iris, uh, when the program ended, you, you kind of said you were a little uncomfortable with something, and and, and uh, <laughs> tell us what that was all about. I think, I think everybody should hear that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have always wondered a little bit about um, why all that blood shedding was necessary here in, 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 in that story. I mean, I like really the part of this, this, this powerful manifestation of the power of God and the faith of, of Elijah in, 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 in that story. And God responds and he, he proves he is the, the true God. And now things are cleared. But why did he then have to go through all that bloodshed? So all the, all the priests of Baal, hard. some 400 plus that had been praying for the fire to come down yeah. and it failed and they were taken down to the base of the mountain right. and they were killed by fire and by sword as Guillermo uh, brought out. So, so when, when, when the people of God are seemingly exercising so much violence, that, that is something that, that, that I struggled with. Mm -hmm. And when, when Guillermo kind of uh, brought that connection here to, to the end time, for me, this for the first time made sense. Mm -hmm. Because in, if this is truly something that is repeated in the end, that brings out the final destiny of those that are rebellious against God and that there is a point of no return there is a point of extinction, and it is it has to be so for mm -hmm. for that whole problem of sin to be solved once and for all, rebels cannot exist forever. Mm -hmm. And most rebels don't just quit. you mm -hmm. know uh, sometimes when when you think of World War two and 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 all the horrors that took place there, would have been better just to let you know, the Nazis steamroll over everything and destroy all the Jews and, and so on. Would that have been better, you know, just to lay back? Or does it require some force at times in order to counter evil? And, and that's the question I think God faces mm -hmm. as, he, as we approach the end time. Uh, God desires that all would, would, uh, would come to, to the right knowledge. Uh, God desires, desires that it would happen without force of any kind, mm. that people would just be persuaded by, uh, by his character. Uh, but in the end, uh, there will be those who, who don't make it in the end. And so Mount Carmel kind of foreshadowed that. And it's tragic, anybody who, who ends up in that place. It's not what God wanted to happen. But sometimes in our choices, uh, we, we leave no other option. Yeah. When does this Battle of Armageddon take place? You know, it, it talks about the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, is that happening in the Sixth Plague, Guillermo? No, right, because uh, when you read verses 16, he says, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So they're gathered, and in verse uh, 14, you have the notion of those uh, spirits of demons um, gathering them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So you have, uh, they go together to gather them to the battle. Um, 
uh, of that great day of, of God Almighty, the spirits of demons in verse 14. And then later, verse 16, it says, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So there's the uh, gathering, mm-hmm. but not the actual battle. The battle itself isn't portrayed. So uh, as you may remember, verse 12 actually is later than verses 13 to 16. Verse 12 is the moment when the secular powers begin to question whether Babylon is really serving their best interests. And in chapter 17, you see the secular powers turning against Babylon and destroying her. That's the drying up of the Euphrates River. And then, uh, so the, the verses 13 through 16 are the gathering for the maximum power of the opponents of God. But then the whole thing dissolves. The drying up of the Euphrates means they lose their confidence in Babylon. And the whole thing splits apart. And that's what you see in uh, the seventh plague, uh, where uh, the, the final destruction of evil takes place. So the battle itself is kind of a one-sided battle, but it happens in the seventh plague, not in the sixth plague. So let's go to verse 17. And chapter 16, and uh, I invite everybody who is watching to have your own Bibles uh, handy. Revelation 16 and verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Now I have a question for you here. The first bowl falls on the earth, the second falls on the sea, the third falls on the rivers and springs. The fourth falls on the sun. So it seems like all the different aspects of the world are being affected at one time or another. But here, the seventh falls on the air. Why the air of all things? What do you think is going on there? To be quite honest, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's... Um... Uh, I don't know. I really don't know why the mm-hmm. air. Um, the only thing that, um, yeah, because you see, the, the word itself, air, I don't think it happens again in the Roku Revelation. Mm-hmm. I think it's the only occurrence, um, if I'm not mistaken. Probably, I think, just yeah. off the top of my head, yeah. So I, I, it's difficult for me to, to have, you know, a strong... Uh, evidence or basis, I'm not sure. There is one place. I just thought of it. Ephesians, chapter 2. Yeah, what are you thinking? Well, isn't uh, Satan the the, the prince of the the air, of the... Ah. Isn't that that space? I think we're getting warmer. Yeah. Yeah. It's been exciting studying God's word, you know, yes. in, in a group where s- somebody may know something, the, uh, the other one doesn't, and then you start uh, seeing clearer. What Ephesians chapter? 2 and uh, verse 2. So uh, let's start with verse 1. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. Mm -hmm. So good work, guys. I think we're, we're onto something here. There were two views in the ancient world of the residence of Satan and the residence of, of the demonic. One was the idea that it was under the ground. You know, mm-hmm. and that's where Dante and whatnot, you know, it's, it's the underworld, okay? It's down beneath somewhere, and, you know, where the, the volcanic flames come up, etc. Mm-hmm. But also in the New Testament, you have a witness of the idea that the residence of Satan is in the air. And that the, the demons kind of are between earth and heaven trying to prevent God from doing his work here on this earth. Both of those views are in the ancient world, both of them are witnessed in the New Testament. After all, Revelation 9.1 is the evil comes out of the abyss, a hole in the ground. You see, that's the underworld mm-hmm. view, but here you have the air. Mm-hmm. So I think that what is happening here is that Satan's residence is being attacked. In the fifth, 
it's uh, a plague on the seed of the beast. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. Satan's mm -hmm. earthly residence. Mm -hmm. Attacking the air is uh, attacking his very personal residence itself. So that would mean, since air is everywhere, this is more comprehensive than earth, sea, fountains of waters, sun even. This is sort of everything is now being finally dealt with. So if evil in this world is something worth getting rid of, the good news here of chapter 16 is that the time is coming when God will put an end to evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pray that uh, when that day comes, we will be found in, in the right place. So uh, again, verse 17, let's see. Chapter 16, 17. The angel poured out his bowl in the air, and out of the temple came a voice mm -hmm. from the throne. Mm -hmm. So the question I have for you here, the temple and the throne seem to be the same thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, what relationship do they have to each other? What do you think? It's, it's, uh, one, I think one possible interpretation of this, right, is that the throne is inside the temple. Or somehow, right? Um, and then um, this gives you the understanding that the temple, the heavenly sanctuary, the temple in heaven is the ruling center of the universe, uh, which is very interesting, right? Because um, then the same place where the decisions issue from or the ruling of the universe of all the created universe, all the, the worlds that God has made, is the same place from which come the decisions for our salvation too, mm -hmm. right? And for our redemption, for forgiveness. You have the notion of the temple and the sanctuary system of that understanding of the, the temple, the sanctuary was a structure um, that God would dwell among his people, as a holy God amidst the people mm -hmm. that needed to become holy as he's holy. So we, we think of sanctuary as a place of worship, but I think you're pointing out that that's actually the governing center of the universe. It's both, right? Yeah, that's both yeah. of those together, and they're equated here. So that's surprising, you know, God's prophetic surprises again. Uh, it's surprising to see the two being treated as if they were one and the same. But uh, that's, it's natural. If you go back to chapter 4, you have a view of the heavenly sanctuary, but it's also the governing center of the universe. The throne is, is central to that story. Mm -hmm. So um, this putting the two together is actually quite common. Um, among Seventh-day Adventists, you know, the question has often risen, uh, Seventh-day Adventists have put a lot of attention on the earthly sanctuary. Remember the tent mm -hmm. with the, the holy place and the most holy place and the altar burnt offering and the altar of incense and the laver and the curtains and all of that. What does that represent, Iris? Is this earthly sanctuary, it's got to mean something. What does it represent? Mm -hmm. I mean, what I have taken away from it, it, it represents basically God's salvation, his work, Christ's salvation. And it's also interesting, you have the showbread, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Christ says, I'm the bread of life, right? And he is the light. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I think many of the symbolism that we have in that earthly sanctuary that are depicted to us, are actually the basis of, of some of Christ's um, statements, I am mm -hmm. the, the light of the world, the, the bread of life, and so forth. So I, see, I can see meaning in the sanctuary as symbolism, as um, a way to convey to people that God is going to deal with the problem of sin. Okay. 
But you have stated, I think, one of the three positions pretty well. What, do you have a thought on that? Well, you know, I think that what is so powerful, and you brought the idea that what do we do with these notions of this slaughtering? And I think here we have a point that helps us also better understand that in perspective. That God rules from, from a throne from a them- and from a temple. And in the book of Hebrews, we read that we have this high priest that serves in a temple not built with human hands, and it is not the blood of animals, but it is his own blood. God rules. Mm-hmm. And part of the way he rules is through his blood. Mm-hmm. So God is essentially also a serving God. Right? Sometimes people struggle, should I serve God? Why should I serve God? Before we ever ask that question, he has already served us. And so we're just, if we care about him, we, be, we follow so his response, example. Right? Yeah. yeah. And the notion also yeah. about the destruction is we have to also understand that the same God that has the burden of dealing with the issue of sin as a matter of his responsibility as the nurturer and provider of harmony, joy, uh, love, and peace, He is the one that was willing to die for us. And his throne is in the place, the heavenly temple that was represented by this earthly sanctuary. And that ultimately then was revealed at the cross. Mm -hmm. Let me let me quickly review. And and I would get this from uh, there was a biblical uh, Daniel and Revelation committee that met in the 1980s and into the 1990s, and I was a part of that at least for a time. And uh, uh, Bill Johnson wrote a, wrote an article where he examined what Seventh Day Adventists have thought about the earthly sanctuary, and he said one answer is the earthly sanctuary represents what God is doing in human hearts. Okay, and that was like John Harvey Kellogg, the Living Temple. You know that that our bodies are the temple, and it's what God is doing here on earth. That's what it's all about. Uh, a second view is that the earthly sanctuary represents a heavenly building. That in heaven is actually a building with the two apartments and all that is going on. So this was mirroring what was happening in heaven. The third view, I think, is what I, what I hear uh, Iris particularly saying, The third view is that the earthly sanctuary represents heavenly realities. Not necessarily a building. Well, it could be. But the important thing is what God is doing there for our salvation. And uh, the the Kellogg view is a valid one in the sense that the New Testament does use sanctuary language for our bodies and for the church. You see, the problem with Kellogg is he denied the heavenly side. And uh, the church has always felt that the heavenly sanctuary is an important part of our salvation. So sort of a, sort of a quick uh, uh, review of that. Let's go on to verse 18. And can here, I, can I, yeah, go ahead. Uh-huh. Just um, this, it is done. Yeah. This reminds me of the cross. Yeah. When yes. Jesus said, it is finished. The only problem is that in no. the Greek is different. I see. Okay. You it's always a different have to verb. come up with the Greek. Yeah, you know, like, uh, because I, break. I was she, like... She had a great idea going here. Come no, on. the same All thing right. came to my mind when I was preparing. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, what is going on here? Yeah. But they're two different yeah. verbs. Okay. Uh, one is the verb that can mean, like, to happen or to become is the verb that you have here. And it's, yeah. it's translated, it is done. And the other verb is... Uh, it's, I think it's teleo. Tetelestai. Yeah, yeah. Tetelestai is the actual form. Yeah. Of the, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think it's come from, from te- telos. the goal. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah. And so it has to the do end. with something being completed, mm-hmm. finished. So, yes. You know, if yeah. you're using only the English, right? But, yeah. but uh, you know, yeah, but uh, we should remind our viewers that the Bible is not written in English, right? As yeah. much as English is a wonderful language, you know. Yeah. And I, I think. You know, I don't want to discourage anyone from thinking that, that you, you can't take an English Bible and, and, and go yeah. deeply into things. But it's always a good idea when you see a connection like that to check with somebody who does know the original, make sure yes. that it's an actual parallel. 
This is one of those cases, this is sort of a ghost parallel. Uh, let's see what my NIV says, it is done. Yeah. Okay, and that's a good translation, gegonen. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to tell us die is a word from the end, you know, at the end of a book, tell yes. us, yes. you see. So Jesus has come to the end. Uh, it would have been a good word here too, so, uh, but it wasn't the word that John chose or that the, the angel in the vision chose. I think that maybe um, also the person that is trying to study and maybe they are not familiar or most likely they are not familiar at all mm -hmm. with biblical languages. There's different uh, softwares that they can use also. There's yeah. interlinear, uh, also in print, there's interlinear yeah. Bibles, right, that they can consult mm -hmm. and they can see what's the actual Greek word. And they can use also uh, a concordance and uh, yeah. also a system with numbers like Strong's numbers to tell yeah. what is the actual word. They're based on the numbers so they don't have to know. Let me, let me tip off our numbers. audience. That's a good suggestion. Uh, there are Bible interlinears where you have uh, the Greek and then the English uh, paralleled with that word for word. So you can go to, the, to the, te the word or the phrase and see what the Greek word underlying it is. Mm -hmm. You know, check the parallel, see if that matches up. Uh, go to a, a lexicon, which is a dictionary mm -hmm. uh, that gives you the meaning of the Greek words. And, and there's a lot that you can do without uh, having a, a reading knowledge of the original. Yes. Yeah. But it sounds like something important is happening yes. here. There yes. is something significant at this point. Is yeah. it that God now finally takes the enemy on, head on? And is it possible that you are, you are catching what we could call a, a thematic parallel? Okay that using the same words Jesus used might seem almost blasphemy here to talk about, you know, the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, but it's echoing what Jesus said without the full, uh, the full weight of that it was Jesus on the cross. That's the most decisive event in human history. This is a subsidiary event. It's part of a bigger it's picture, a but it's not the, yeah, it's a ripple that. effect of the other. So uh -huh. you might be onto something and maybe a different word is used just so as not to diminish what happened at the cross. So yeah, I, I like it. And, I have a uh, question for you. Most of you um, are, are, are making important points. I have a question. Um, mm. This, it is done. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how do we connect this maybe with the close of probation? Do you think that this is basically like, it's been accomplished, this is the, end of the close of probation, or maybe the it is done uh, is maybe after the close of probation, like now has, it has happened, is, now is the time to, to come for the second coming. You know, it's, you know yeah. uh, what is done is for the, you know, yeah. it seems like uh, something has happened, why, either the close of probation or the timing after the close of probation for the second coming to happen. I think we've concluded the pro close of probation comes before chapter 16, so that everything in chapter 16 is after, yes. except perhaps the gathering for Armageddon, which we saw as a, as a flashback mm. to give a little background. Uh, so that would be a done point, you know, and, and let's see, in chapter 22, you have a close of probation text, you know, let the one who is righteous be righteous still, the one who is unrighteous be righteous still. So, um, yeah, but I think this, it is done, is more final than that. It's, it's the second coming yes. and, uh, yes. you know, that uh, evil has been uh, dealt with in a sense uh, yes. uh, decisively. Yes. I do want to get on to verse 18. And uh, it says there in verse 18, then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. And the question I have is, what do you make of all these phenomena? You know, lightnings, noises, thunders, earthquake. What's yes. going on there? The very interesting thing is that you have um, a, a very, uh, if not the same, a very similar list at the, right before and right at the end of the series of the seven trumpets. Mm -hmm. So before the first trumpet, and then at the very end of the series, you have this, uh, at the very end, you also have great hail, but you have, you know, these phenomena, either a similar list or, 
or, or, or the same or maybe uh, word in a different way, but you have these phenomena there. And the interesting thing is that at the beginning of that series, you have the notion of prayer. And then you have the trumpets. It gives an idea that the coming response is judgment for deliverance in response to prayer. So I would say that this is good news. Deliverance mm. is here. Well, here, I'll, I'll, I'll tweak that just a little bit because I, I like what you're putting together. Uh, each of these, with the exception of this, each of these comes in a sanctuary introduction. You have chapter 4, which introduces the seals. Mm. You have chapter 8, which introduces the trumpets. You have 1119, which introduces the, the battle of 12 through 14. So up until now, it's, it's kind of anticipating the salvation. But here in this fourth time, it comes at the end instead of be, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. you know? So yes, it comes at the end of the trumpets, but it's at the place that's actually introducing what follows as well. So um, it, it, it means God is going to act decisively uh, for mm -hmm. salvation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that's, uh, that's an important piece uh, to mention here. Um, I would say the Mount Carmel experience is the high point of evil. All right? They've united together. Uh, the kings and the priests you know, have united together into a worldwide alliance uh, against God and against his people. And that's the high point. But it quickly crumbles. You see, next couple of verses, and it's all torn apart. So the high point of evil is actually projecting its cliff-like drop-off uh, yeah. to, to destruction. It's not like it's uh, going to be gradually restored yeah. and fixed, right? It's just... Yeah, it's bam, uh, when the time... And, and that means, you know, a lot of us spend time looking and saying, you know, are, are we seeing God beginning to work and stuff like that? Well, when God steps in, like I said, if it, it was an issue of power, it would be just like this. Uh, when it's time for God to act decisively, uh, he's not going to have to sweat it, uh, so to speak. Rebellion, it's demonstrated here in the plagues, has failed to unify the universe. And uh, God has been patient with rebellion. But at the end of chapter 16, we've come to the place when the consequences of rebellion are fully revealed, and it's not pretty. So God's prophetic surprises in Revelation as we're coming to the conclusion of the plagues. And we will finish up next time on GPS. <laughs>